For centuries, we have harnessed the power of America's rivers by confining them. We have stopped them behind tens of thousands of dams and channeled them through thousands of miles of dikes and levees. Our civilization prospered on their banks. But no dam or levee was built to last forever. In today's society, dams and levees continue to age and deteriorate as development both upstream and downstream of these structures increases. Through the seasons and years of hot summers and cold winters, concrete turns brittle, foundations crack, maintenance grows costly, structures are abandoned. Increasingly, strong storms now stress our dams and levees to the point of failure. Feared would fail. It seriously it has some structural problems. We all got the uh, warning for evacuation. Flood victims are The now water was up to the rafters. The granite curbing just tossed like nothing. And whether the levees hold over top, uh, fail. Dam is considered a major threat. The dams and levees that have long served a vital role in shaping our communities have in many cases become dangerous liabilities. Owners for maintenance problems. Warning sirens, another levee has broken. But with their demise has come the seeds of rejuvenation. From Washington State to Pennsylvania and New Hampshire and many places in between, communities and public agencies are removing hazardous, obsolete dams and levees. They're not only averting devastating failures and floods, they are restoring clean water, fish and wildlife, and even saving money in the bargain. They're pioneering a new way to strengthen their communities by creating more natural and resilient river systems. A lot of the dams in New Hampshire are old. You know, a lot of the dams were built back when the hydropower powered the mills in the state, powered the Industrial Revolution in New England. And uh, so they could be 100, 150 years old. I could tell you some of the state-owned dams, the average age of the state-owned dam is about 100 years. And so they do, they're aging. So there's always deficiencies. And these deficiencies are, are very costly to address. To meet modern safety standards, dam owners are sometimes faced with spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain and repair dams that long ago outlived their purpose. Maxwell Pond Dam, again, it was a one, another dam that was owned by the city of Manchester. We inspected it on our regular basis. We issued a uh, letter of deficiency. They had uh, many maintenance items that they needed to take care of. There's also a concern about if that dam were to, were to fail, we had to actually issue the city of Manchester administrative order, kind of ratchet up the enforcement. The simple things we had fixed. Uh, the other things were very large uh, items to repair. Cracks in the wall, um, sinkholes, things like that weren't so easy to repair. Beyond the dam's structural deficiencies, the stream it blocked had become impaired as well. Over time, the slowed waters of Black Brook heated up, spurring bacteria and algae to bloom. As the algae decayed and the water temperature rose, the water's oxygen plummeted and fish suffocated. Front Street flooding from the Maxwell Dam in Manchester just... But the city's decision to remove the dam didn't come until two major storms hit Manchester. Maxwell Pond was actually breached. The Black Brook flowed around it, damaged Front Street. It threatened the uh, utility lines, electrical and live gas mains. So there was a lot of uh, man-made infrastructure coming under risk. So it went over the chain link fence, over the debris and that, and straight across. And down my driveway, and back to the brook, taking the driveway with it. The National Guard had the area closed off, and what went through my mind was, oh my gosh, how long am I going to be closed and how much business am I going to lose because customers can't get here, I have employees that I need to keep working, and I have jobs to do, and suppliers can't get here, and um, how long is this going to affect my business? The bottom line is if I don't have the doors open, I don't have cash coming in, so that was, it was 
kind of worried. I mean, crews were here working. We had an existing natural gas line that crossed at the Blackbrook Dam. We had to deploy people on scene to stand by to protect our facilities to be able to isolate that segment should there have been some catastrophic failure of the bridge structure, the dam structure. And from that, it was identified through the structural deficiency reports with the state that in fact they're going to remove the dam. And I think the city of Manchester realized that this was going to be an ongoing issue and recur year after year. These dams that are built on these rivers have outlived their, their lifespan. They're not designed and never were designed to handle the flood frequencies that we're experiencing today. Dam ownership is a huge liability and a result of their failure can result in the loss of life, a loss of homes. A lot of the public does not understand that a dam owner has these liability and safety issues. Um, you know, many times when we look at dam removal, they can't understand why a particular dam owner wants to remove their dam. Uh, they like it for many reasons, and they're reaping the benefits without having to pay any of the costs associated with it. The cost to repair it, which would include um, repairing the items listed in the letter of deficiency from the dam bureau and removing the sediment from the impound area was uh, well over a million dollars. The out-of-pocket cost to the city to remove the dam was $40,000. And in this economy, the city decided to make the most fiscally responsible decision and decided to move forward with removal of the dam. And as a result, we were able to relocate our facilities to a more secure location uh, closer to that bridge abutment and therefore uh, be able to you know, secure our, our system in that area. From the storm clouds that forced the hard decision on Maxwell Pond Dam came silver linings for the residents of Manchester. Yep, this is the first time we've been out since the dam was removed. We did monitor for dissolved oxygen, 6.66. So that's quite an improvement and does meet water quality standards for dissolved oxygen. We not only found that here at the upstream portion, but also in the area where it was impounded and dammed and then downstream as well. So that's good. Nobody ever came here before really. It was just, uh, you know, just a forgotten park in Manchester. Before, when it was the, the pond was here, we, we couldn't really hear the water running, but now that um, the, the pond has been drained by the dam removal, that now the water is more active, seems to refresh in everything and just, uh, just gives you a good feeling. Wow, is that beautiful or what? It was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Looks about as clean as it was when I was growing up. Blackbrook's revival serves as living testimony to the resiliency of embattled streams. Within a few months of removing Maxwell Pond Dam, the brook not only met the water quality standards of the state, but also the aesthetic standards of its citizens. My thoughts were negative towards the dam removal, and I, I remember I told one alderman that I'd be on the dam with them when they started tearing it down, but um, that's all changed. It, it's been nice, it's invited more wildlife in the area. The, the kids are playing and walking around where, where the pond was. There's, there's birds, there's a uh, nice sanctuary for, for the animals, and uh, it's been a real nice place to live. We've uh, established Black Brook back into its natural course and provide an experience here for, for everyone to enjoy. And, and, and I think we've created a situation that's come close to eliminating flood impacts because if you look upstream now, there's no more impoundment or barrier backing that water up. So when floods come in, they now have to fill up to the top of the bank that we look at here and then they'll actually be able to fill over onto the floodplain, and that's what dissipates the energy and creates all this new flood storage capacity, which will help protect the infrastructure of the Front Street Bridge, the utilities, and the downstream businesses. Soon after the dam's removal, a heavy bout of spring and summer storms put the new floodplain to the test. It's been five days of heavy rains and the water without the dam the water's just going where it needs to go it's just flowing downstream and it's no backups no problems no sandbags no national guard nothing we're just open for business 
got the right texture, mm -hmm. right color. Now I feel very confident that we could have a hundred year flood and we, again, a third one, and we wouldn't have the, the extent of damage that we had that first year. Um, that the water now has a place to go. It's not going to back up there. I mean, it, the brook is moving. This was quite painless because from the municipality standpoint, we were correcting a safety issue. From the state's perspective, they were correcting an environmental issue as Black Brook was on the state list of impaired waterways for dissolved oxygen. So this was viewed by all collaborative partners as a, you can't lose. It's environmentally responsible, it mitigates a safety hazard, uh, it was a fiscally responsible thing to do. There was no downside by removing this dam. This is, the, everybody wins. A common misconception is that all dams prevent flooding. In fact, the majority of dams were never designed to control floods and can actually intensify them. These structures are not flood control structures, so therefore they're always filled to capacity. So you have a, a plug, like a plug in your pipe, and it backs the water up. So when you get these storm events, uh, there's, the water fills up immediately, and when it hits this area, it slows everything down. In 2004, with the Harmony Junction Dam plugging the river, the massive rains of Hurricane Ivan could not flow fast enough downstream, and an entire neighborhood was flooded. Our house is this one right here. This is the deck of our house. And you could see where the water is up to the deck. The people across the road in what's called Porter's Cove had a mandatory evacuation order from the police. A number of the homes at that time were completely underwater with the exception of the roof line. So the rescue crews were operating in the dark uh, with uh, fast moving water, fast moving current, with a number of obstructions and they had to make two trips in to bring these people out. There was a lot of prayers, a lot of emotion, a lot of fear. And couldn't believe it that we'd ever go through anything like this, ever. The Harmony Borough Water Authority owned the dam. It had not served any purpose since 1935 was the last functional use of the dam. So they wanted to get rid of it, but nobody wanted it. Uh, anyone could have come and taken possession of this property. As far as Harmony Borough was concerned, it was a liability for them. Wild Waterways Conservancy, a small volunteer organization, rose to the challenge and bought the unwanted dam for $1. We did, and with removing the dam and improving the stream health in mind, so with the help of American Rivers and the, the, the State Department of, of Environmental Protection, um, we got funding to begin the process of removing it. Harmony Junction Dam was removed for a total cost of $90,000, a fraction of the cost FEMA and Butler County incurred here for flood-related damages in 2004. Definitely, it's going to reduce flooding here. I was glad to see it come out. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I echo his. And that doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> that I totally agree. <laughs> and, and oftentimes people ask when we're taking these out, what, what's it going to look like and what can we expect? And I generally tell them, look downstream. And that's what it will look like. This is one way that you can make an immediate impact. And by immediate, I'm saying maybe two or three years, but nonetheless, you can make a lasting and permanent impact by removing these dams. So I think it's really important for communities that, are, that have these situations to go ahead, make the effort. If the seven of us can do it here, you guys can do it out there too. With this dam in particular, what impressed me was how rapidly the stream healed itself and, and, and it is currently in the process of healing itself but it responded within about probably three weeks and a couple heavy rains turns back to what the stream originally was and what it should be. Just a few miles north of Harmony where the community of Grove City has removed two obsolete dams of its own, 
a university professor and his students have been monitoring the ecological resurgence of Wolf Creek. The results are tremendous. The number of mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies have increased every year. There's at least four species, perhaps five species of darters in this stream, uh, which is excellent. We have to recognize that the stream systems are continually evolving. So that, that's a continual process. And when you, when you have a dam in there, that process uh, stops or is slowed down. But once we remove the dams, then the stream will begin to evolve and will and get back into its original channel and, and, and will become a functional stream system again. When the removal was first discussed, not everyone on campus was eager to see the dam go. We were concerned at first because uh, the dam had been an integral part of the campus for uh, many, many years. In fact, no one uh, living associated with the college remembered the area any differently. But we discovered that we could make a very beautiful situation without the pond, too. So it worked out uh, equally well, if, if, in fact, maybe even better. Cunningham Mill Park. Terry Farron was the borough manager of Grove City for 22 years. It was his responsibility that the city was adequately insured against the liability of its dams. This is the lower dam, the dam that we removed in 2005. Probably the early 2000s, our insurance carrier became concerned over the condition of those dams. We knew that they were deteriorating, but uh, budget restrictions prevented the borough from taking any, any action that would have corrected uh, the problems that were developing. Faced with a pair of decaying dams and no money to rebuild them, the borough sought help from the experts. It turned to the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, which since the mid-1990s has been removing dams at a rate of about 15 a year. We remove dams for environmental restoration purposes to restore stream habitat. We also remove them to eliminate liability, uh, both in terms of, of the ownership and as well as reducing a, a public safety hazard. We're finding that when you no longer need these structures and you remove them, that the systems tend to be very resilient and they bounce back very quickly. We've done extensive monitoring, everything from uh, changes in um, fish populations, uh, aquatic insect response, riparian response, water quality response. There's a number of different things we've looked at, and the response of game fish have been quite dramatic. Uh, in some of the blue ribbon trout streams in Pennsylvania, we've seen a fourfold increase in trout biomass following removal of some of these structures. Um, similar response we're seeing on some of the, the larger water courses with uh, smallmouth bass response as well. So more fish, bigger fish, uh, is a good thing uh, as far as the angler's perspective. Well, it's exciting to be able to take part in something that you're going to look back years from now and say, I helped with that. We just decided that it was time to take them out and improve the area and help it go back to the way it used to be. I like it. I didn't pay too much attention to the dams before, but now you see how nice it is. There's not a backup of water, like a stagnant pool. Now it's just a nice stream with some nice plants, and you can actually access it and walk along it. It's nice. It, it made an improvement. It was good for the community. While motivation for removing dams may vary, these communities show river restoration projects provide a multitude of benefits and often breathe new life into their communities. That's the route that we took and it was very successful. Smaller communities like Griff City, and I'm sure larger communities, are facing uh, tough budget times. And when you look at public facilities, and where to invest your money. You want to invest that wisely to the benefit of the community. When we looked at the two dams, we chose to go the removal route rather than to take the scarce taxpayer dollar that's out there today to put into uh, two structures which no longer served a useful purpose.
The nature of our watersheds has changed drastically since our ancestors built the first dams and the first miles of levees. Forests and fields that once absorbed rains have given way to a hard and impervious landscape of asphalt, steel, and shingle. A landscape of subdivisions and shopping malls. Water runs off these rooftops, roads, and parking lots. And more storm water than ever is looking for a place to go, rushing downstream. Both levees and dams, in the old way of thinking, that if we just put the dam up and if we just put the river in a, in a chute, if you will, uh, we'll all be protected and we, they won't be, we won't be harmed. The problem with that is that levees age and fail, just like dams do. The storms, particularly in the northwest here, are more uh, severe, and they come more, uh, those severe storms come more often, as we've seen over the course of the last 20 years. No man-made or built system is going uh, to be as good as the natural systems, which have been around for a lot longer and have accommodated floods much better than what we do with the man-made systems. So rethinking them is critically important but also to change how we deal with these old uh, levees that are failing. As the changing climate brings more intense storms and more frequent floods, King County and Seattle are rethinking their relationship with their rivers. They are removing or setting back levees to reconnect rivers with their historic floodplains. This reduces the flood risk for people living nearby and at the same time restores vital salmon habitat. Uh, we want to make sure that public safety is protected, uh, that the damage from flood is, uh, floods are mitigated um, so that we have less of that in the future, uh, but that we also reclaim habitat along the way. Removing and setting back levees has become a significant part of the region's strategy to restore the resilient nature of its rivers. You're looking down what is now an excavated area where the levee just was up until a couple of weeks ago. We've removed um, somewhere on the order of 20,000 tons of, of earth and rock from here. The, the river begins to come up with um, rain and flooding. It will find it much easier to spill over into this floodplain that the river will tend to find one of a variety of possible avenues or channels out here, basically to begin meandering and forming new channels back in here in its historic floodplain. Where we stand may be a new channel by this time next year. And here we have the ability to restore the processes. And this is where we try and avoid using an engineered approach and instead uh, release the river and allow it to do the hard work of creating habitat. And we can stand back and simply watch it as these ecological processes take over and make this river once again a very dynamic and important part of the entire watershed. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak. So, and that's what will happen in, in this particular case. The levee is gone. The river is going to have 60 to 70 percent of its floodplain um, uh, available to it again and we anticipate that over the next several years this will stabilize as a multi-channel uh, river area with um, significantly expanded rearing habitat for juvenile Chinook salmon in particular as well as the spawning habitat for all of these species, the five other species of salmon in the watershed. Here on Washington Cedar River Seattle and King County are in the final stages of removing homes repeatedly flooded over the last few years. Once the residents are relocated to safe ground, the Rainbow Bend levee will be removed. The Rainbow Bend project is our largest floodplain restoration opportunity in the Lower Cedar River. The levees are shown here in red lines, and this is the Rainbow Bend levee, which actually doesn't provide very much flood protection. In a big flood, the Cedar River cuts right across. Cedar Grove Road cuts here and cuts right across the Rainbow Bend property. It also back floods from the back side and floods the mobile home park that's here. So this is a project that, where what we do for people to get them out of harm's way is also exactly what we need to do for the fish. Well, so the intended outcome is to no longer have residents living in such a dangerous place to no longer have to send emergency first responders 
in to a dangerous place during floods, and then to open up this 40 acres of land to open that back up for natural floodplain functions. At Cedar Rapids, where King County removed the Cedar Rapids levee, the region's efforts to work with nature rather than against it are already paying off. One of our biggest floods on records happened in 2008, and there's a mobile home park downstream of that site that usually floods in big floods, and it didn't flood this year. It, it, that storage happened on the Cedar Rapids site. This much is clear. Many levees and dams have outlived their original purpose, and in many cases, present a troubling liability. But this also presents a unique opportunity to eliminate these liabilities by bringing back free-flowing rivers and the many vital benefits they provide. I think this is the right kind of approach. I think it's, these are long-term solutions and they become more and more self-sustaining over time. If you just give the river a little more room, you can accommodate everything. You can have your homes and your towns surrounding the river, and then the river just needs enough room to flood and to move a little, to create habitat, and to modify that habitat over time to keep it dynamic. So I think you can have it all.